Professor Willie Messerschmidt himself sketched the design. A giant glider capable of carrying tanks, artillery, or 200 fully armed men. It was to be towed by no fewer than four aircraft. Immediately, the company received an order for 200, and in great secrecy, construction began at Lightpine near Ulm, where in just 14 weeks, an army of workers ran up one of the largest aircraft ever built. It was appropriately called Gigant, or Giant, and it was big. With a wingspan of 180 feet, an all-up weight of 40 tons, even today it wouldn't be overshadowed, being only slightly smaller than a jumbo jet. And as the first aircraft was rolled out for flight trials, 11 more were on final assembly, and a further 62 in an advanced state of construction. To accomplish all this in just 14 weeks had been a staggering achievement. The loading of the tanks and guns was tested in a mock-up fuselage, which interestingly was fitted with clamshell doors. These are now common, of course, but they were first designed for use with the Gigant. And although the huge glider was a fabric cupboard aircraft, the floor was stressed to take the heavy armour. To assist the machine to take off, up to eight rocket units, fueled with hydrogen peroxide, were fitted beneath the wings. Even so, the first flight of the Gigants carrying a mere four tons of Bricker's ballast, would clearly be a day to remember. It was on the 21st of February, 1941, that Flugkapitän Barr, the pilot, and the word somehow seems inadequate, was towed to the mile-long paved runway that was considered necessary. He was seated in a single narrow cockpit some 60 feet above the ground. It must have been just about the loneliest place on Earth as he got the feel of the control surfaces, which were equivalent to the entire wing area of quite a sizable plane. A Junkers 90, one of the few big four-engine planes the Germans possessed, was used to drag the Gigant along the runway. Then, with the takeoff rockets going full blast, and the Junkers 90 flat out, the enormous glider was airborne for the first time. The first hurdle, Dropping the two-ton undercarriage was clear without incident. That first flight, according to German records, lasted just 22 minutes. That may have seemed rather longer to Herr Bauer. However, he reported that the flight characteristics were good, though he did add that the controls were a bit on the heavy side, and suggested that a wider cockpit with a co-pilot to help with the pushing and pulling would make things a bit easier up front. This suggestion was adopted on the 101st glider to be built. The huge glider was brought in for a good landing on its skids, and immediately a shortcoming was apparent. After landing, the 40-ton aircraft was immobile until it was jacked up and the undercarriage was repositioned. However, this wouldn't matter when it was used operationally as an assault glider. Development flights continued, though the captain of the fifth flight the redoubtable woman test pilot, Hannah Reich, struck a somewhat more critical note in her report. Impossible. It had to be so primitive because it in reality had only to make one flight and then finish. Um, you couldn't bring it back. So it was so primitively built that it was so difficult to fly. You needed so much strength. And you see, this what is too hard for me in a five minutes flight that is too hard for a strong man in a one-hour flight. So I tried with this argument to convince Udit to stop it, but he didn't believe it because Messer Schmidt said, she is a too small a little girl, but not a strong man for fighting, so don't believe her. They didn't. It was obvious that the Junkers 90 was underpowered for the towing job. Its crews were reporting that they were barely able to keep a safe flying speed on takeoff. And this with a lightly loaded glider and the rocket assistance. Obviously, a more powerful type was urgently required. There was a proposal to join together two Heinkel 111 bombers and add a fifth engine. This was named the Zwilling, or Twin. Whilst this unlikely aircraft was being developed, an interim method was adopted, the scheme that Messerschmitt himself had originally sketched out. The use of multiple tow planes. He had proposed four, but in practice, only three were used. They were Messerschmitt 110s with a total of 8,850 horsepower, and every single one of them would be needed. 
Three long 10 mm steel cables connected the glider to the tow planes, the arrangement going by the name of Troika Schlepp, or triple tow. The takeoff was in many ways difficult. The glider pilot lit the rockets as soon as the Troika started to move. Takeoff drill called for the Gigant to unstick first at around 55 miles an hour indicated. The two outer tow planes then left the ground, followed by the leader. The aim was to climb out at 80 miles an hour. And with 40 tons behind them, the tow pilots had their hands full. The 110s were hanging on their props near the stall. The slightest drop in engine power could lead to a disaster. And disasters there were. On one test flight, the glider rockets fired on only one side, dragging the Troika together. 129 men, the glider was carrying troops, were killed. The parachutes are not, as one might suppose, the three-man crew leaving the aircraft, but the burnt-out and reusable takeoff rockets. Hannah Reich, on her second flight, had trouble with the Troika Schlepp takeoff. The left bomber, even when still being on the ground, or just above the ground, went out. He had to release the cable, and two couldn't tow it alone. We had six rockets on the wing, which when they once were blowing, you could not stop them. So when you lost one towing bomber, also the right bomber was lost. I was hanging on one bomber that was like a little fly compared with my dime. And all six rockets were burning. I knew I couldn't stop it. I could get 150 feet high. Then the rockets were finished after three minutes or four. And I knew the, the, the single tow bomber had to release me, otherwise he would... So I could just, when he released me, and I could release all three ropes. And so before the ground, I touched the ground, it was like this, but I, we had the good luck that I just, it was only good luck, touched the ground when the ground makes such a wave. So one had broken his knees, another had a nerve shock, but you see, I was, I was well and only deeply thankful that nobody was killed and I finished because I was so much against it because it was too big. Russia had now been attacked, and the 200 Gigants were to be used to supply the Eastern armies. But the Troika only had a range of 250 miles, and the giant gliders caused unacceptable chaos en route. The delivery of a few zwilling tugs helped, and some Gigants did make supply flights to the Eastern Front, and were used for the evacuation of the wounded. But there was still the problem of getting enough suitable tow planes. So behind the screens at Leipheim, there was a new proposal. Why not make the Gigants self-powered? So six Gnome Lerone engines had recently become surplus to the requirements of the French Air Force were fitted. A wartime German newsreel shows the powered version in use on the Russian front. Supplies being loaded. 12 tons of ammunition and guns and tanks. These happy looking soldiers were clearly not fine with the Gigant. The troops hated it. They nicknamed the fabric covered aircraft the sticking plaster bomber. They much preferred to fly within the corrugated metal security the dear old three-engined Junkers 52 transport. Gunners formed part of the 11-man crew, which now included flight engineers and two pilots, chosen one would suppose largely for their strength rather than flying finesse. The Gigant was still flown with manual controls, although a permanent undercarriage had now been fitted, which solved the problems of airfield mobility. The takeoff must have been an impressive sight, and the original German soundtrack is not inappropriate. On the supply routes to Russia, the Germans enjoyed their superiority, so there wasn't much risk. Though the passengers on board seemed far from happy. The gunners would be needed on other fronts, however, because in addition to supplying the Eastern Front, the Gagants were also to be used to ferry desperately needed fuel to Rommel's Africa Corps. The fuel was carried in unprotected drums, and the Gagants lumbering along at 130 miles an hour 
were ruthlessly cut down by British fighters. Few survived. The Gigant Glider might, at this distance in time, seem an absurd folly. But if the timing of events had been only slightly different, and if the gliders had been used in the role for which they'd been designed, assault, then 200 or so could have landed out of some dawn, just after Dunkirk, with 20,000 troops, 100 tanks and artillery in the Weald of Kent, and little more than the rifles of the Home Guard to contain them.